Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Word Balloon. This is John Suntress. We're uh, it's the preamble before the show begins, and I'm always happy to uh, give you some show notes. Uh, if you have questions, comments, or requests from me, email john at wordballoon.com. It's the best way to reach me, not Facebook messages, not Twitter messages. Email john at wordballoon.com. Follow me on Facebook under my name, John Suntress, and the Word Balloon Network. Follow me on Twitter at John Word Balloon. I have a YouTube channel that is up and running and has videos, and I would like you to uh, be a part of it as well. Would you mind subscribing? It's free. Uh, john, uh, or I, I should say it's under Word Balloon. So uh, check that out. And as always, thank you for listening to the commercials before the show starts. I know that uh, you know people get annoyed by commercials, but they do pay the bills and they do make a difference in my bottom line. And the only way I get paid is if you do listen to the spots. So in, in advance, thank you for listening. There might be one more spot before we get started, and then we'll uh, be underway with the show. But as always, thank you for your attention. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Word Balloon, the comic book conversation show. John Suntress here. Really fun conversation I want to present today. My buddy Dave Baker. Now, you may not know the name, but he has had a really fun career. He makes comics. He makes movies. He's a screenwriter. He uh, has had adventures in uh, the low-budget world that he shares with us that I think is pretty funny as far as movies go. And low-budget comics, frankly, and I don't mean that in any demeaning way, but uh, he's making his own books. And uh, we talk about a lot of them today. Dave is also a YouTuber under uh, the channel Total Nerd and has been doing some excellent histories of comics. I happen to catch his uh, Watchmen day, uh, or Alan Moore uh, episode in particular, and I thought it was very well done. Uh, great information. And uh, he does it without yelling, which I think is a big uh, plus as far as uh, some of the YouTube punditry that's out there. But uh, yeah, I've, I've, I've known Dave for years when he was making mini comics. And uh, I am cheering him on in his uh, pursuits as a writer, both in comics and uh, television and film. And it's a pleasure to welcome him uh, to the show. Dave Baker on today's Word Balloon. Word Balloon is brought to you by Aftershock Comics. Now, you know about Aftershock. I've been talking about them for about a year now. Fantastic uh, company with great series. Let's say about some of the stuff of Aftershock that's available right now. You can get uh, Midnight Vista, Issue 3. Uh, Donny Cates' Volume 3 of Baby Teeth is available. Uh, it's called Cradle. Shoppers Will Be Liquidated, Issue 2 is out there. Marguerite uh, Bennett's Animosity Year 2 uh, Collected Volume. Cullen Bunn's Knight's Temporal, Issue 4. The Collected Edition of Jimmy's Bastards, the Complete Series. You got Juan Doe's Bad Reception and Matthew Clickstein's Issue 2 of You Are Obsolete. Marguerite Bennett's great graphic novel, Horde. Tim Seeley's Dark Red, Issue 7. Uh, just some of the great books that are available right now at Aftershock Comics. More coming in the month of November. And uh, I'll tell you, they uh, they have great creators that have genre-bending ideas. And uh, I'm sure you will find a book that fits your tastes. Check out their website. You'll find full story descriptions, preview pages, and the diamond codes on how to order these books through your local shop at AftershockComics.com. Word Balloon is also brought to you by the League of Word Balloon listeners via Patreon. Thank you greatly, League, for your subscriptions to Word Balloon. It means a lot. You're keeping the lights on here at wordballoon.com, and it's uh, greatly appreciated. Uh, we've got more content coming as I expand the uh, podcast and also onto other platforms like YouTube as well, our YouTube channel. If you want to help out the cause, you can go to patreon.com slash wordballoon or go to wordballoon.com and click on the Patreon ad. Thank you greatly for your support. In fact, thank you Patrons Day is coming for Patreon November 18th next week. So uh, expect that as well. But thank you greatly for your support, League of Word Balloon listeners. All right, without further ado, let's get into our uh, conversation with uh, Dave Baker. Dave's making a lot of fun comics right now. And uh, also, as I said, he's had some pretty crazy adventures in the uh, screenwriting business. And uh, he shares all those. Also, great encounters with uh, some wonderful creators uh, that are uh, of note, and I uh, think you will enjoy this conversation with Dave Baker for today's Word Balloon. I'm, I'm talking to Dave Baker, and Dave, you'll forgive me because I'm going to use part of uh, our, our conversation to talk about Tom Spurgeon's passing, because literally, as, as we're recording this, the news came tonight, and uh, we were just talking about this, and, and you know, you, you tell me what your, your thoughts of uh, the loss of... Uh, the uh, the great uh, jer- comics journalist uh, who who worked at the Comics Journal, of course, 
and had his comics reporter blog for for many years post uh, comics journal but yeah your thoughts on uh, on tom spurgeon yeah i mean uh like i was just saying to you you know i i wouldn't we interacted a couple times online i, I wouldn't say that i knew him well but i i valued his work quite a bit like I, one of the key areas that comics is lacking, in, in my opinion, is that there's not enough actual comics journalism, and there's yes. not enough there's not enough academia around comics. Yes. Uh, and and people like Tom Spurgeon, like they really helped, you know, as as standard bearers for the medium, they really went out and proselytized. They went out and they they told people that comics is the greatest art form that humans have ever created, and. And that's something that I uh, deeply value, obviously, and and I'm just so heartbroken. You know, 51, yeah. man, yeah. 51. That's so sad. Like, yeah, I just my heart aches. You know, it's, I mean, dude, I'm telling you, I, I again, I don't mean to start us off on a downer, but such a good guy, and uh, I, I knew him a little bit better. I mean, we, we as I was telling you before we started recording, we would we when we were at conventions together, we would certainly hang out, and uh, I appreciated. His point of view in his blog, and he was incredibly kind. And would if I had an, uh, a, a, a good interview, and he thought it was a good interview, he would immediately link to it. And I know I would get uh, new listeners from the Comics Reporter blog, and that meant a lot because again, he was doing this at the Comics Journal and uh, on his blog years before I got into this. And I don't even—I mean, I always say if you want to call me a comics journalist, that's fine. I think of myself as really just having an entertainment show that kind of focuses on comics. He was a comic journalist. He would dig in and say, why is Archie Comics doing a Kickstarter? What the hell's going on? Why can't Archie just afford to do its own book and then and, and do the interview to get to the bottom of it? Stuff? And then, you know, I mean, that's just one story that pops to mind. And he was doing, like I said, at the Comics Journal and on his own as well at the Comics Blog. Started his own uh, convention in the last couple of years uh, in the, I want to say the Cincinnati area around Ohio State because I think the, the Billy Ireland uh, Museum and, and all that that's attached to Ohio State was affiliated with what he was doing. Is that uh, was his convention CXC? Yeah, Tra- Cartoon Crossroads Columbus. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's right. It was Columbus, of course. Yes, it was Columbus. Yeah. That's right. And yeah. Uh, yeah, man. Oh, I'm just I'm I'm really I'm beside myself. I can't I can't believe this happened. And I'm uh, I'm going to I'm I'm sure that uh, when I put this out, I will in addition uh, put out um, an interview that uh, that uh, the time that Tom was on Word Balloon and we had a great conversation. And like I said, yeah. I just I always admired I I really and I always have figured, oh yeah, I'm gonna get Tom back on at some point and everything. And he was inviting me to CXC as well, and it was just bad timing that I couldn't make it to his show. I always intended to. Uh again, he's younger than me. I mean my God, he's he's three years younger than me. I kinda figured, okay, well, you know, we'll get to this. Uh geez. Sad loss. Wonderful guy. What else yeah. can you say? You know? Yeah. It's a it's a real it's a real tragedy and and a, and a hit to the comics community like i mean the industry in general it's a hit but it's also like he was just such an active participant in the community of comics you know oh, yeah. there 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 are some people who are definitely more industry types where they're you know they contribute in one specific way but he was somebody that was you know from what i observed and 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 enjoyed his writing and stuff it was it was all very um he was he was actually in it in it you know like you said the archie thing like that archie thing i i have so much respect for for that because yeah why the fuck was archie running a kickstarter you know what i mean yes like yeah yeah i mean that's the thing it's like yeah i mean you get it when when an indie creator and even and even a name in you know creator is doing a passion project or something like that but you'd think it's like wait what the hell's going on with archie i mean and yeah it it was kind of weird and it's and also he was just really fearless and I think respected by all the Marvel and DC and the publishing outlets, by the same token, was definitely not an access media, uh, air quotes, journalist that, well, we know we're going to get a nice puff piece from Tom Spurgeon. No, you got straight dope from Tom Spurgeon. And if he felt you were doing something wrong, he wasn't afraid to, to say something about it and get to the bottom of it, too. So there was that side to Tom. But even as you said, too, it was everything on his blog. I mean, just... Uh, maintaining the, the the comics history and finding the great uh, blog posts and websites or lost videos or even current academic videos of, hey, you know, 
Art Spiegelman was just at, uh, you know, the University of, you know, USC and doing a big uh, talk about comics and stuff, and here's the video. Or old stuff like that. Or finding wonderful old uh, co- examples of comic art, not just from the big two, but really like, you know, Nader and uh, Fiction House and some of the other smaller publishers of the 40s and 50s. And, hey, you know, when nobody ever talks about this artist, here's a great example of his work. And it's like, oh, yeah. No, I used to, I mean, again, Comics Reporter was a, definitely a destination where you were going to get interesting comic book content and not the top five Wolverine villains. No offense to, <laughs> no offense to me. You know exactly what I mean. There you go, man. Yep. So, yep. yeah, I mean, that's the thing. So, yeah, this is a real, I mean, good, good guy. Uh, beyond his work as well. But yeah, no, man, I, I agree with you. Absolutely a very knowledgeable comics historian, advocate, and journalist that we've lost today. So that's, I, that's I, mean, I, yeah. I couldn't even I couldn't even tell you how many cool things I've found through Tom Spurgeon. Totally. You know what I mean? Yes. Like I, I wouldn't I wouldn't even be able to list them all. Like you know, even just his Twitter presence alone. Yeah. Like even just that, which is like obviously he has contributed so much more than just a fucking Twitter profile. But, like, even just his Twitter profile, I would find weird, cool stuff all the time. Yep. Like, he just posted something from, like, I feel like it was, like, two months ago or a month ago where he posted, like, I think it was him that posted a bunch of old Bob Newhart episodes or something. <laughs> and like, I didn't see that. <laughs> and, like, in the, in the Bob Newhart episode, uh, it was from, like, Bob Newhart's, like, second or third show, whichever one he was a cartoonist in. Yes, in Bob, that, that early 90s show, yes. Yeah, yeah, and in that episode, in that show, he played a cartoonist, and in the specific episode that Spurgeon was talking about, there was, like, a bunch of footage of the image founders at the, in air quotes, Eisners. You know, it wasn't literally the Eisners, yep. but it was, like, you know, here's Jack Kirby and, and, and Bob Kane and Jim Lee and, you know, uh, all these guys, like, in an actual TV show. Yeah. Um, no, it's true. It. I'm going to feel really bad if it wasn't him that posted that, but I'm pretty sure it was him that was talking about it. It wouldn't surprise um, me. Well, and I know uh, the Decades uh, channel ran uh, like it was a whole Bob Newhart weekend. And sure, they leaned on, you know, the 80s Newhart show and the my favorite, the psychiatrist show from the 70s that totally was 1970s Chicago. Uh, but, yeah, they also showed episodes of Bob, the, the 90s show. And it's a shame because in the first season, it, it, it mirrored – the co- the real what was going on in the comics industry because he had a character from the fifties or sixties that a new company bought and wanted to reboot as a gritty you know in the in the vein of image you know let's take yeah. this old character and make him gritty and, and reboot him and everything and he ended up going to work for the new company and there were a ton of comic book cameos including our T Bear was in there and I'm pretty certain. That uh, oh god now I'm blanking uh, one of the one of the main image guys um, the guy who uh, Witchblade uh, Mark um, uh, Mark Silvestri yeah Mark Silvestri of course yes I mean you know so yeah old timers and current guys would show up on Bob and then all of a sudden they retooled the show and he worked for a greeting card company it's like oh man so yeah I mean really <laughs> like the first season I, I I don't know if it's on DVD or not but yeah that first season of uh, and it's just called Bob. Uh, it's absolutely comic centric, and it, and it really it's it's okay as far as the actual sitcom, but it is amazing. Like that, you know, there's a crusty old lady that's a letterer who kind of is like a Marie Severin sort of person. I mean, I I don't know the guys who created it, but it's like they knew the comic business. It really is pretty amazing how accurate it was for early '90s uh, the the comic market in the early '90s. It's amazing. Yeah, I, I never, I never really saw that show. I mean, I obviously I know who fucking Bob Newhart is, but sure. I, I, I had never really delved into that that specific show. And uh, when you know, What's old that? Dirty Spurgeon, when when the old Dirty Spurgeon was like, "Hey, look at this," I was like, "Ah, oh, this is amazing." Well, and like and like you said, I mean, that was the great thing about the Comics Reporter blog; it would have all this cool stuff. So to be included in his list for the day was seriously one of the best compliments I would ever get. And it was this affirmation of, all right, I guess whatever I'm doing, I must be doing something right because Spurgeon likes what I'm doing. Truly. Yeah. So it means yeah. it really means a lot. Well, anyway, Dave, I, want, I appreciate you taking some of our time to talk a bit about Tom because, again, it's such fresh news. And for people listening, um, I am going to also post 
uh, my conversation with Tom the one time that he was on Word Balloon. And I always feel, uh, uh, this sucks, man. I mean, this is, uh, I'll tell you, I mean, coming from sports radio, when I would know athletes that passed away, uh, Walter Payton was a friend. And I had to, like, uh, in my capacity at the sports radio station, not only did we have to talk about his passing, but I had to produce... Uh, a tribute of a bunch of sound bites and just this kind of you know memorial retrospective of like five minutes of content, and I always feel like oh man, it's bad enough that I'm grieving you know that a, a guy I knew and really enjoy appreciated and stuff has passed away. I gotta you know, I gotta make I gotta make something now out of his death. Oh, I hated doing that. So, Ish. and then Bill Shelley, you know, just a couple of months earlier had to do the same thing when he passed away, and that was such a shock. Bill, Bill, the comic book historian. I don't know if you know. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. All of his wonderful biographies of Joe Kubert and Harvey Harvey Kurtzman. He just made this spring a Jim Warren uh, biography that's fantastic and really the whole history of Warren Publishing. An amazing yeah, I, book. I have I have that Warren book. I not, I'm going to confess that I have not read it, but I do own it. Well, there you go. Well, I'm <laughs> glad you own it, man, because really it's terrific and. Like an idiot, I'm like, oh yeah, before the end of the year, I'm going to have to talk to Bill Shelley. And of course, he passed away in September, so, ugh, just, just, or uh, either September or October. I, I want to say it was when I was in Portland for Rose City that I saw that he had passed away. Oh, just, just fucking yeah, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of amazing, though. Like, I mean, it's, it's just amazing to me that the, the access and the kind of interconnectedness of comics, you yes. know what I mean? Yeah. Like there are so many, there are so many people in other mediums where when they pass away, it, it's it is a ripple effect, but it it, it doesn't it, it doesn't affect the community in the same way. Like comics is such an interwoven, tight knit group of people yep. that when when one person has a little bit of trouble, and you see it in a positive way too, you know, when Absolutely. somebody when somebody trips and falls, everybody's there for them, you know. A hundred percent, man. When Norm Breakfogel had his stroke, and we were all. Sad. I think a lot of us went to you know GoFundMe and helped and pitched in for an example. Uh, yeah, well, uh, lot, William you know. William Messner Loeb's yeah. last year when everybody found out that he was like homeless, which is just unconscionable to me. Yes, I don't yes. understand why there isn't some sort of big two pension fund like I agree. where once you've once you've written over fifty issues of the Flash, you know you get seven hundred dollars a month, like something. I like, agree, I, man. Yeah. Well, you know, you know the Siegel Schuster story and how, you know, the Jerry Robinsons and Neil Adams is that all had to go out there and really make kind of a public nuisance and embarrassment campaign to get uh, the powers that be at Warner's uh, before the Superman movie came out to do the right thing and give uh, Siegel and Schuster livable wage pensions for their yeah, contributions I mean, and stuff. It took it, it took Jerry Siegel publicly putting out an air, in air quotes curse on Superman. Like, he put out that press release where the right. first line is, I put a curse on this Superman movie. Yeah, like, you know, yep. he, he's like the, the bitter Alan Moore of 1970-whatever. Well, Dave, this is <laughs> this is one of the reasons why I'm having you on, man, because you know your comic book history, and I appreciate that you know this stuff. And you mentioned Alan Moore, and uh, one of the uh, one of the reasons that like I, I picked up and everything was I happened to catch your YouTube video about Watchmen that you made. And uh, so, tell me, tell me about these YouTube videos. How many have you made, and um, are you, are you, you know, is this is this a current thing that you're doing? Yeah. So, uh, for anybody who's not familiar with my work, I'm a writer, artist, cartoonist. I've made a bunch of comics, uh, Fuck Off Squad, and Action Hospital, probably <laughs> being the ones I'm most known for. Um, and my day job right now is I work for a media company where I write for a Snapchat show. And basically, in between episodes of the Snapchat show that I write for, uh, I uh, uh, I work on one of our YouTube channels, which is called Total Nerd, and uh, I write um, little kind of uh, 15, 20 minute comics documentaries, uh, kind of explainery type videos. Yeah. So I've done one. I did one on Jack Kirby. I did one on Siegel and Schuster. Uh, I did one on uh, the Watchmen. Uh, scenario, everything involving uh, Alan Moore and the, the contract that he was promised, meaning that you know after the books came out, after Watchmen came out, um, they would uh, go out of print because single issue comics didn't stay in print; they just That's came right. out and they went out of print. And then a year after that, 
the rights would revert back to Alan Moore and Dave Gibbons. Um, unfortunately for everyone involved, um, Alan Moore didn't get a lawyer and DC conveniently didn't honor that clause in the contract and they immediately published a trade paperback which has been in print since 1986 yep. and has gone into, I don't even know how many printings, 30-something, 40-something printings, That's if right. not more. That's right. And so because of that, they've maintained ownership over the characters, and that's why we have Before Watchmen and the Watchmen movie and this new Watchmen show yep. and Watchmen Beanie Babies and Watchmen <laughs> Porgs. I don't know. Yes. That, that, <laughs> it's, just, it's just very... Uh, I mean, look... Uh, I love comics, and I know that sometimes when I talk about these old comics history things, I can kind of sound like a curmudgeon. Um, well, if you're a curmudgeon, I'm dead. <laughs> <laughs> Being almost 20 years older than you, I think I might be dead then. Yeah, exactly. So It's just very, it's just very sad to me that there's so that. much of comics. Like, I, if, if anybody doesn't know, like, uh, National Publications, which later became DC, was literally founded by mobsters. That's like, right. Her- Harry Donenfeld, who's the guy who started it with uh, Major Malcolm Wheeler Nicholson, uh, they Harry Donenfeld they 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 got the money to make the company because Harry Donenfeld was best friends with a uh, with a mobster named Jack Cohen who was a rum runner, and that guy basically fronted them the money to buy a printing press to use to money launder his his rum running money through, right. and so because of that. There's all of this, like, everybody's always trying to underhand everybody all the time. Yep. Um, which I'm not saying that modern publishers are necessarily descendant from that same legacy, but spiritually, there's a lot of that kind of everybody operating in a worst uh, possible scenario. You know, yeah. you have all these, you have all these companies coming in right to comics right now, and they're all intellectual property farms, and they're all trying to pretend like they're here for comics. And they're all just trying to get movie deals. Yep. Um, you have all of these creators who see that the money is in the movies, so they're just taking really shitty screenplays and then adapting them to kind of bad comics, which yep. don't sell, but then still get adapted into movies because development executives are, you know, they just don't want to read a script. It's hard. Car- Cowboys, uh, Cowboys versus Aliens, a recent yeah, example. Yeah, you know? exactly. And that, that book is even more of an extreme in that, it was an idea that was created by an executive. He commissioned the comic and then worked with a local retailer here in Los Angeles to pre-order like half a million copies. That's right. So he just bought like half a million and well, then was like, it's the highest selling comic in North America. Yep. And there are other publishers of recent vintage that have done the same thing. And I even remember kind of digging in a couple of these kind of stories and asking creators in the know, I'm like, am I just country mouse? And I'm just finding out how things work in the big city and I have no idea, you know, in terms of how they cook the diamond numbers and stuff like that. And thankfully, people like Tom, people like Heidi McDonald were out there on the front line saying, yeah, hey, listen, you know, this this ridiculous graphic novel that's being sold for like $1.99 is going to be the top-selling book of the month, and it's all bullshit. And yeah, they were able to then go, hey, look, it's the biggest-selling comic book of the month, so obviously this is a very popular property. Let's go. And they got the movie made. And, you know, it's really shitty. I know uh, Fred Van Lenty was the writer of the comic, the actual comic, and he couldn't even get his name on the goddamn credits of the movie. And it's yeah. like he's the guy who actually wrote the... St- I mean, like you said, it was. I'm not going to name the uh, executive because I don't even want to give the guy stupid uh, publicity, for Christ's sake, because he is still out there. And, he's, and he does still own a bunch of IPs and things like that. I'm not a fan of the guy. He'll never be a guest on Word Balloon, I guarantee it. Uh, and I know some people that he actually screwed over in terms of giving them, you know, whatever money. And, yeah, by the way, now I've got control of your IP over the next 15 years. and never did anything with them, and it was short money and stuff. Uh, not a good guy. And, uh, yeah, I'm uh, not a fan. It's, it's just so bizarre to me that, like, comics is, you know... If, if we're speaking in stereotypes, comics is founded on the back of Superman in North America. Right. You know, obviously, Absolutely. Ob- yes. Obviously, there's there's many nuanced interpretations of this. Yes, I'm aware of the Yellow Kid and the long history of racism within the comics medium, but I'm specifically talking about the, the periodical pamphlet is basically built off the back of Superman. Yes. And it's so bizarre to me that... People want to read about truth, justice in the American way, but they don't want to actually live that. 
It's so crazy. To well, me. The, in fairness, a lot of a lot of both comic book readers and even you know more obviously people on the outside, they just don't know. They don't realize that these terrible deals are, were happening and, and creators were getting screwed. And that's interesting because regarding Watchmen and stuff, um, and maybe I'm too overly sympathetic because when before Watchmen came out, and I even would say this to the few. DC executives during before Watchmen that would were allowed to talk to me, and neither of them, by the way, are even at the company anymore. John Cunningham and uh, Bob Wayne, and this is right during the fi- New Fifty Two, and they were there to beat their chest about how great the New Fifty Two was selling. You know, isn't this wonderful? And I'm like, okay, yeah, let's talk about before Watchmen, and uh, they're like, oh well, you know, uh, and they'd like kind of struggle. I'm like, guys, uh, it's your product, you're the marketing guys. Stores are having, I'm sure, these same questions, and I'm just asking some innocent reader questions. And I, I absolutely, I mean this. It may sound condescending, but I sympathize with Moore and Gibbons. But that said, I'm like nobody expected Moby Dick was always my shorthand for Watchmen's success. And I can also understand from a publishing standpoint that the nice, the right thing to do, in air quotes, is obviously honor this contract and stuff. But when you've got a seller that's perpetually selling, and you're you've got the rights to it, and you're a company, you're, you're, I'm sorry, that's business is shitty that way. And I and I even remember talking to Gibbons about this, and I said, you know, Dave, it's absolutely horrible. But by the same token, aren't you able to walk into a bunch of offices now and get meetings and be like, hi, I'm Dave Gibbons, I co-created Watchmen. You might want to talk to me about some of my other ideas. I mean, I I understand that point of view, and I don't think it's. I don't think it's incorrect. I would just say that imagine a world where Alan Moore was not, maybe he was a little bit more mellow. You know, there were some points in this story where Alan Moore has not been great as a guy. He's, he's signed over some rights when he should have, and he's, you know, done some things that are like, ah, bro, maybe you just like get a lawyer, you know? Yeah. But, but aside from that, imagine if he was just treated a little bit better. Oh, yeah. Watch- Watchmen is empirically, on a mainstream level, the most complex comic ever made. Imagine what he could have done if he got two or three more stabs at the at the apple. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know. Maybe, maybe we would have gotten the real Citizen Kane of comics. You know what I mean? And I just, I, I weep for the medium as a whole that the industry treated these guys this way. I hate it, man, but I, again, I point to both of their careers post Watchmen, and I think they've they've done well. Again, absolutely got screwed on this deal, but it did put them on the map. And suddenly, we were paying more attention to both Alan Moore and Dave Gibbons in ways that we had, and even with the success that Moore had with Swamp Thing, or Dave was certainly the hot Green Lantern writer or artist rather prior to to Watchmen stuff. And again, another, Dave Gibbons, by the way, another guy who. I absolutely adore and have nothing but massive respect for, and truly I don't want this misconstrued as, you know, like, oh, well, too bad, because I, it does suck, and it is shitty. Um, yeah, and certainly, as you say, about Moore as well. But I, I do think that both men have, you know, despite that bad business move and stuff, they've done all right, and there are a hell of a lot more William uh, Messer Loeb's and, and others that yeah. didn't have that, that golden goose uh, oh yeah, you know to to you know hang their career reputations on and continue to uh, you know create new things and I mean really and in a lot of ways I, in fact I talked about that with Dave too in terms of look at all the you know he was even before Image Bendis always says this and I think he's right he's like we stand on the shoulders of these creators because of what they were doing in the eighties and they were the you know mavericks of their day I mean you know Gil Kane of course tried. In the uh, '60s, and, uh, with um, Black Mark and his name is Savage to do mm-hmm. creator-owned comics, and it's amazing that he was doing this in the late '60s. Um, you know, unfortunately, the, distrib- the distribution didn't work out for him. Um, but yeah, I mean, you really look at the the, the success of the '80s and creator-owned comics that started there, and look at where we are today. And I think you know, it really did start with that era of creators and guys like Warren Gibbons. Yeah, I just also I want to say that uh, I met Mr. Gibbons at San Diego two years ago, three years ago, two year, two years ago. Um, I published a book called Shitty Watchmen, where my 
<laughs> my my friends and I, we all redrew Watchmen page for page, panel for panel, just really poorly. Um, it's like the 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 project is kind of half uh, performance art piece of you know what happens when you deconstruct the most uh, famous deconstructivist comic of all time. You know when you like reverse engineer the th- thumbnails, does the mechanics of a nine panel page still work? Uh, without the craft of illustration applied to it. Um, and then also, partly we did it just as a joke because it's fucking dumb. Sure. Um, and w- I took him a copy at at San Diego, and I, I gave it to him. My partner Nicole and I, Nicole Gu, went, went and we gave him a copy, and he was the sweetest, kindest, just like he totally got the joke. <laughs> You know, because you, you know you're walking up and you're you're there's a bunch of people there and you're like, ah, should I really give this to him? I don't know. Maybe he won't think it's funny. Maybe he'll oh, be really man. pissed. You killed him. Um, but you know, I I like I gave it to him and I was like, hey man, I I gotta be honest. Like we've we've really uh, we've we've paid for a lot of artist alley's tables just off of this one stupid fucking book, man. <laughs> and uh, and he he started laughing and he was like, oh, that's great. Consider it on me. You know. I, uh, I'm, I'm, and then he like looked at the book and he was like, "Oh, this is so weird. I can see my drawings inside of your drawings. That's so, that's so funny." What a compliment! Um, so that's I'm, fantastic. Yeah, we also did shitty Dark Knight Returns, and I have not given one to Frank Miller. <laughs> I'd be afraid because, he, yeah, like Dave, Dave, uh, nothing against Frank because I really, uh, I only met Frank once, and unfortunately, I ran out of business cards, and I'm like, this is like 2006 or seven. I'm like, I got a podcast. I'd love to have you on. He's like, give me a business card. And I did. Or I tried to. I'm like, I'm out of business cards. And he shrugged and he walked away. I'm like, but <laughs> but I could like write down your contact info. Please come back. And he did. Yeah. But that's okay. But yeah. yeah, I mean, that's that's classic Frank Miller. And again, I always say Dave and Walter Simonson are the two greatest guys in comics. I mean, and there are plenty of nice people in comics, but the two of them are just ex- exceptionally nice and it's amazing, given their body of work as well, that they don't necessarily need to, but they are incredibly yeah. kind to newcomers and schmucks like me. I mean, I'm you know I'm on the periphery for God's sake. I mean, at least you know you're you're an actual artist. <laughs> and stuff, you know? Yeah. That being said, I took the guy a dummy version of his own yes. book and was like, "Look, I've been ripping you off, <laughs> and it's covered under parody." And he was like, "Great, keep doing it." <laughs> I hear you. Man. Well, you know, but again, I mean, that's the thing. Like, you know, and then the generations before them, Eisner was always a guy like that. That really like, show me what you're doing. I want to see what you're doing. Please show me. And you know, I mean, God, Oming and Bennis told me, like, I mean, literally, they were he they were showing Eisner their first mini comics and stuff like that and Eisner would take the time to look at them and say oh well this is good and maybe you should do this instead and really give them constructive criticism so it doesn't surprise me that Dave got the joke that's that's fantastic yeah I'm I'm glad he did too uh, I would have been a little sad if he was angry at me because he really does seem like the nicest dude so um, so I want to hear more about this Snapchat show because again this is where I'm like you know okay boomer I'll <laughs> <laughs> John, John, I don't really know if you want to hear that much. It's pretty. It's well, it's I'm fun. Curious. It's well, a day. It's a day job. You know. It's a. It's something that allows me to uh, be a little bit creative. I, I made a living as like a screenwriter for the past six or seven years. Yes, and I then want to talk about that. But go on. Some of my freelance stuff kind of dried up, and I was looking for a. Mostly, I was looking for health insurance. Uh, uh, amen, I don't know son. if you know this, but being a cartoonist, hmm, not a lot of money in it. I'm hip. Yeah, yeah. Uh so yeah, so I, I work on a Snapchat show called Rankworthy. It's uh you know, uh it's kind of a TMZ E Snapchat oriented, you know, it's fine. It is what it is. We don't have to spend that much what, time. Well I'm about curious it. what like what kind of length is it? Is it I mean, because again it being a Snapchat show, like Yeah, so it's a it's a ten minute like have you ever seen any of those kind of like Watch Mojo or Looper, yes. like ten movies that are on oh, like, sure. right now. Oh yeah, no, and yeah. Uh, yeah, YouTube is littered with that stuff. Absolutely, yes. So it's it's like a mixture of that and like you know, ten celebrities that had secret hookups or whatever. Okay, all right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey man, no, and yeah. well, again, and and truly, as a as a as a, and again, I'm going to sound incredibly grandpaish, and you'll forgive me, but as a as a guy who came up through traditional broadcasting honestly man when when the digital explosion happened i was thrilled because i'm like i saw opportunity that's why i started word balloon that's why i'm still Mm -hmm. doing word balloon almost 15 years later because i believe in these platforms and 
Um, the great thing is that certainly people younger than me, it's nothing for them. It's like breathing. Well, yeah, I'm going to check something out. Oh, it's a cool video. And I mean, you know, I, I had Snapchat for like five seconds and I'm like, yeah, this this is it for me. And that's fine because <laughs> Snapchat doesn't need me. That's that's OK. I'm on Instagram, as people may know. Word Balloon is on Instagram. And I mean, even then, I'm just posting old nostalgic shit and stuff. Like I'm watching Dick Cavett and it's like, hey, look, there's Joe DiMaggio from 1972. Nobody cares. <laughs> you know, but I but I think it's funny, you know, or I'll do comic book stuff and promote whatever my shows are. But honestly, um, this what they're doing on Snapchat and what's happening on YouTube is just as valid as all the streaming shows that are now happening. And as as we're talking, certainly the week that Disney Plus hits the atmosphere. No, it's a different ball game, and anyone it is still a wild frontier, and I believe that anyone could come up with compelling content and gather an audience. And this podcast is a classic example of that. And I have so many, in fact, before you and I were talking, went out to dinner with a good friend of mine that's a writer for the Wall Street Journal. He's written several history books and is a very serious journalist. And he's like, man, I am so envious of what you're doing. And I'm like, because he's one of my most accomplished media friends that we grew up together and went to high school and stuff. And he's like, you're doing great, man. And I'm like, yeah, I get it. I kind of am. I'm like, you know, I'm not I'm not a big name. I'm certainly not Adam Carolla or Chris Hardwick or any other successful, you know, certainly Conan's having a great couple of years now doing podcasts and stuff. But I always like say it's like I'm like a good bar band that, you know, can can make a living in what I'm doing. Well, and I'm not actually who am I kidding? I'm not making a living, but I'm do- you know, I'm doing all right. And I have a supportive audience that appreciates the content and that's why no, I think this is great, and I and I from the flimsiest TMZ like Snapchat show to real YouTube stars, and God, look at you know Collider and some of these net, you know uh, Geek and Sundry and everything. These these networks that have been created that actually are putting out content that are getting hundreds of thousands of views and stuff like that. I think it's fantastic. Yeah, I mean, I I also am a big believer in. Uh, putting work out online and, you know, gaining a social following. And Hell yeah. I've, I mean, I've seen that firsthand, you know, Nicole and I were posting pages for fuck off squad on Instagram. And then we ran two Kickstarters for fuck off to print fuck off squad stuff. And I just did a Kickstarter with Alexis Zira for our new book, night hunters, which we raised like $22,000 for, Excellent, which is like, man. way to go. It was like more money than I could ever like that's, that sounds like a million dollars to me. And like, we, that's all just because of the internet. That's because of the interconnectedness of the comics community and the fact that we're all accessible to each other finally, you know, for yes. so long, for so long there were these publishers and distribution models and, and really shitty monopolies. And oh, those monopolies are still there, but there's a, there's, there's an immediate, um, there's immediacy to the internet now that, uh, you know, sometimes is negative, <laughs> but sure. you know, for the, for, for the sake of this conversation is very, very positive, you know, like our, the book I'm doing with Alexis, you know, uh, night hunters is a dystopian, uh, cyberpunk comic that takes place in Venezuela a hundred years in the future. <laughs> and like, that's just not, it's just not something that like a bunch of publishers were leaping over themselves to, to put out. And we found a good publisher and we funded it through Kickstarter and we're going to put this thing out and it's going to be in fucking Barnes and Noble. Adam like boy. It's, yeah. No, like, that's great. Dave, that's great to hear. And honestly, again, this is, this is where we are now. Yes, you can gather an audience and you can, uh, and again, we all help each other. It's, I, I love that too. And it's so funny. Some of my other radio friends have dabbled in podcasting and they are still, trapped in the notion of ratings and well the you know the guy across the street's competition and you better watch out and i'm like no it's not like that in the digital platform there's room for everybody and if you like something like watchmen like alan moore i mean my, my example is star trek i can't get enough star trek whether it's positive star trek talk or negative star trek talk I am constantly searching for well, what does this guy have to say and sometimes i find shit I'll be honest, the pundit, I, I don't think they're that good, and they kind of annoy me, so they got my view for their one video, and I'm not into it. I am happy to say, and especially given that, you know, when I met you and you were making mini comics and stuff like that, um, I saw your video, and I'm like, hey, this is great, look at what Dave's doing, this is fantastic. And it is, man, you do a great job, you're very, you're, you're positive, you're, you're talking about interesting subjects, they're well-made videos, 
You're a good narrator. I mean, I you know, you're certainly more telegenic than I am, my man. And then, and, hey, and I get, hey, now, <laughs> hey now. No, it's all good, man. And seriously, I'm I am thrilled for you that you've got this platform and you're doing what you're doing, and it will only help feed into. Hey, by the way, I've got a comic book. Check it out. Um, God, I hope it helps you. You know, with screenwriting as well. I you know, and, and I mean, that's the thing, man. I, I really, I, I think the sky's the limit, and also. Dave, if this is like, you know, if it only goes this far, the journey's half the fun. And yeah, making this yeah. shit is, as you know as well. And everyone I'm sure listening, whether you're an aspiring cartoonist or an aspiring podcaster or YouTuber or whatever, no, I mean, and that's why I'm happy to kind of talk shop with you beyond promoting, you know, any books that you want to, you know, currently promote or whatever projects you want to currently promote. Yeah, thanks, man. I mean, I, I appreciate it, especially like, I mean, as you just reference like we've known each other for a long ass time and <laughs> and i and honestly man like i've i've listened to your podcast since the beginning oh, like dude. the beginning wow like i don't know if you remember how desolate the comics world was of the internet of 2000 and whatever five but man there was yeah yeah <laughs> 2005 2004 2006 where it's wherever it was in there holy shit there was nothing and like finding Finding Word Balloon was like, oh my god, this is this is my people. This is amazing. Oh, thanks, man. Well, you know, I heard people. Jonah Wyland, when he was still running CBR, he did a couple MP3 interviews with Rucka, and I'm trying to remember who else. Right now, it's maybe Matt Wagner. I believe Matt Wagner was another guest, and they were just kind of, you know, oh, let me see if anybody listens to this. And at the same time, down in Texas. Scott Hines was doing fanboy radio at the, and I think he still does, at the Texas Christian University public radio station on Sunday nights. And he started having, you know, in the early 2000s. I I completely forgot about that. And I listened to every episode of that show, too. There you go. This is like, you're bringing me back, my dude. This is pre-podcasting, man. And that's that's the funny thing, and no disrespect meant to Scott, but I... I remember on an early podcast panel, he was on with uh, uh, me and the iFanboy guys and a few others, and he's like, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm on a real radio stand. I mean, again, because he came from initially radio, Scott was kind of very, a little competitive back then. I don't think he is anymore, and we, we he was on my show early on and stuff, but he was like, well, you know, I'm on a real radio station, and I'm like, hey, Scott, you're on a public radio station on Sunday night at 6 o'clock, the lowest rated hour that isn't, you know, after midnight. I'm like, just relax, okay? I mean, it's, yeah, you're in Dallas, yes, in Fort Worth. It's a nice size market, but you're on a public radio station. It's a low-power station. It's like, and also, the other thing is, uh, one of the other panelists said, Scott, you're a po- you call yourself a podcaster when it's convenient to call yourself such. And it's like, yeah, man. And again, I, his, his show evolved. I, I hold no grudges, but it's, again, going back to that time, when and I don't think that the hunger for good content has gone away, so that's why I'm happy to help you promote Total Nerd, your YouTube channel, and what you're doing over there. And uh, no, I think that's great. And like I said, it's only it's another platform to say, hey, if you like what I'm doing over here, you know, check out my books, check check out <laughs> yes <laughs> what you and Nicole are doing. That's great, man. So yeah, yeah. so so um, all right, so you, you you had a successful Kickstarter, and um, you know, so what's Beyond the uh, patrons getting your, you know, your book and stuff, what is the big plan in terms of, like you said, putting it in Barnes and Noble and stuff? Yeah. So, uh, just for some background, yeah. Uh, yeah. So the book is it's written by me. It's a four issue mini series. Uh, it's called Night Hunters, um, and it's the high concept is that in Venezuela, a hundred years in the future, um, it's a police state, meaning that if you want to rent an apartment, run for public office, or have a child in a hospital, you have to currently be or have been a police officer. So the book follows two adopted brothers, one who chooses to become a police officer in order to pay for these cybernetic limbs that he needs because he gets in an accident, and one who becomes a drug dealer. And uh, the book kind of follows them as they try and navigate the seedy underworld of Venezuela and the kind of compromises that they each have to make in order to survive. Um, it's being drawn by Alexis Zirit, um, 
and it's going to be his, published. What was that? What was Alexis's book from a, from a couple of years ago? That was just uh, Space Riders. Space Riders, okay. yes, man, great. Um, I mean, and and forgive the the moniker, but I would say he's part of that lowbrow art kind of graffiti crazy style. Uh, I love his art. His art's amazing. Yeah, I I love it too. He's he's amazing. Um, and, how'd, you get, uh, how'd you get hooked up with that, Alexis? That's great. We we have a bunch of friends in common, and I mean it's that kind of that convention hustle, right? Sure. Where like he does a lot of shows, I do a lot of shows, and you just kind of end up going out to dinner. You know, you, you, the weird thing about being a cartoonist is that you don't have friends in the city you live in. You have friends all over the country. As you know, Dave, I, I would say you and I are <laughs> that kind of acquaintance level as well. Uh, you know, yeah. so no, I, I I always say that when you go to like when I go to I, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but truly when I go to other cities, I always say it's like it's like expensive summer camp because it's like, hey, I'm in another city, but I've got all my friends, all my out of town friends, and we're all together for three days, so we're gonna hang out and have a blast. So yeah, yeah, and so <laughs> we kind of you know we we have a bunch of friends in common, Andrew McLean, and you know a bunch of the kind of uh, Welcome to Hell crew, okay. the out of step arts guys. Um, Funny. yeah, so, you know, we, we, we were talking about doing something forever in a day, we pitched it around, got some yeses, got some noes, and then ultimately decided that, you know, we wanted to do it ourselves because we wanted to own it and we wanted to actually own it, not, you know, kind of a lot of companies that sell in air quotes, creator owned comics. They don't actually sell creator owned comics. They sell comics that the creators own a portion of. Sure. Um, yeah. which, and if that's the deal for those creators that they need to get, you know, through the day, that's great. Yeah. I just know for me, I personally want to own my work because I am so familiar with stories like Siegel and Schuster and Jack Kirby and, you know, all of these people who just got totally hosed. hundred um, percent. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, so, uh, the book's going to be put out by floating world, uh, which is a comic book store slash publisher from Portland. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, they've put out a lot of really good stuff. Dave, you were you check them out? Were you at Rose City and I missed you? Uh, no, I was not there this okay. year. Okay. No. Okay. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the Jason uh, who runs Floating World, you know, was like, "Oh yeah, this looks cool. Let's do it." That's excellent, so man. The three of us all ran the Kickstarter, and thank God it funded. Um, sure. And uh, you know, now we're uh, we're in the process of figuring out. All the boring stuff that nobody wants to hear about, like deadlines and schedules and, you know, print proof approval time periods and all that kind of stuff. Um, Are you, and you, do you have a network of stores that you're going to go out and kind of hand sell to and everything as far as getting them going? Uh, I mean, thankfully, the, the floating world machine is a little bit more well oiled than a having to hand sell. Okay. But- uh, you know, they, they, they have their networks. Uh, yeah, they have a pretty big network. They, they put out, they put out Zach Soto's, uh, secret voice. They put out a book by Farrell Dalrymple called it Wall hurt before sure. image picked it up. Okay. okay. Um, they put out the single issues for Corey Lewis's son bakery before image picked up the trade. So they, they've, they're, they're a, a pretty, uh, stalwart incubator of cool, cool books. Um, they also put out Charles Forsman's last couple books. They've taken over Revenger, and they put out uh, uh, Slasher as well. Um, so they're 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 in that kind of like art house genre yeah. space, which is it's honestly that's exactly what this book is. So it makes I'm very 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 thankful that Jason, uh, you know, uh, well, deemed us worthy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Outstanding, man. That's great. Let's talk a little bit about your uh, screenwriter history, because I know the last time I saw you face to face, we were talking a bit about that. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I've worked on a bunch of weird stuff. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the life of a screenwriter is almost as unstable as the, right, the life of a comic book creator, where you you kind of just like yeah, you, know, you know, journey around, gunsmith for hire, as it were, and then you work on your own stuff on the side that. Nobody gives a shit about for years and years and years and years and years and years. Um, <laughs> you know how it is. I do know how it is, buddy. Don't worry about it. That's all right. But yeah, tell, yeah. Us, tell us about some of the screenplays that you've written and everything, if you can. Yeah, I, uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, the last thing I wrote, I'm thinking, the last thing I wrote was, uh, I wrote a, <laughs> bro, this, this story is so crazy. 
So I've worked for some bigger companies like like uh, Fox and Disney Plus and and Cartoon Network and done some some stuff that you names that you would know. But I'm not going to talk about that because that shit's boring. Okay. We're going to talk about this movie that I got hired to write called Navy Seals versus Aliens. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. It was you uh, had me at a low. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. So like I said, you know, I. Was that for, like, an asylum kind of... Oh, totally. I mean, it wasn't asylum. It was for a company called, like, Action House Pictures, I think. Okay, okay. And they were super shady, and it was really weird. (laughs) But, 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 I I just need to tell this story, because it's so funny. It's amazing. So, I get, you know, I get connected with this producer um, through a buddy of mine. He's like, hey, we're trying to make this thing. Do you have any either science fiction or horror scripts? I gave him one of my horror things. He's like, great. We want to we want to sit down with you and the director and talk it out. Okay, great. So I go on to the Universal lot. It's me, this director who I've talked on the phone with once. Seems like a really nice guy, and the producer, uh, and this other guy who I've never met. I get introduced to him, and his name is Milan. One word. Okay. And I write I, already. I'm like, oh, this is great. I love this Milan. This guy's this shit. I love this. Like Milan, Italy, he, Milan. Yeah, exactly. All right. He's got like a really thick Eastern European accent. So we're all sitting down talking. I don't really know much about this movie other than the title and that they are looking for a writer. So they already have the title: Navy Seals versus Aliens. That's so they had the title and they had a movie poster. Of course they do. And and they said we have three weeks to make this movie. Can you make it in three weeks? To and write I was like, it or to I, actually physically make the whole movie? To, to, to write the script Go in on. three weeks. Go on. So I was like, uh, uh, yeah, sure. Sure. In my, in my head, I'm thinking, I don't even know if we can get a contract signed in three weeks. But yeah, sure, all right, whatever. <laughs> I can write this in three weeks. Whatever you say, guy. Uh, does the cat, the, the check cash? That's all I care yeah. about. Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to, I'm trying to, I'm trying to pay to print some more comics over here. <laughs> So, so we're, we're having the meeting, we're talking, you know, everybody seems like they're getting along. The Milan guy sitting in the corner, pretty quiet. Um, we're kind of sort of talking about what the story is going to be. But the interesting part is that the story is retrofitted from all of these other bizarre aspects. So they have a Air Force, a defunct Air Force base in Louisiana. They have a World War II gunship. And they have four ex Navy SEALs who live in Louisiana that is that are friends with the producer, and so those are like we have to make a movie out of those three things. Wow! So we're talking about how we're going to make a movie, and he's like the producer's like I just got to you know got to hammer this home. These these Navy SEALs are not actors; they are Navy SEALs, so we can't really give them lines. So we can only give. <laughs> Like, the main character lines, because we'll be able to hire one actor. And the whole time, I'm thinking, like, this is amazing. I love this. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, sure. One actor. Sounds awesome. So, we're talking about the thing. The meeting's starting to come to an end. And then Milan pipes up, and he goes... <laughs> he goes, I must, I must get one thing straight. The aliens must be depicted respectfully. And everybody kind of was like... <laughs> Depicted respect. Yeah, how does that work? What does that, what does that mean? <laughs> so the so the the director goes, oh Milan, yeah. Um, are you like a big UFO fan? Do you like have a history with aliens? Like, you know, why? What what does that note mean? And the director gets kind of uncomfortable, and he's like, well, Milan, he has a little bit of a history, and uh. Then the director tells this little anecdote about how he thinks he saw a UFO when he was a little kid. And, man, Milan just lit up like a Christmas tree. Oh, my God. He starts, he starts explaining, John. He starts explaining how he got kidnapped by aliens for 21 years. Wow. They taught him about faster-than-light travel. They taught him 21 different languages. But when they sent him back to Earth to prepare for their coming in 21 21- uh, in, uh, in 2021, they they there was something that misfired about the teleportation device. So he he doesn't remember all of it, and he can't remember the math, and he can't remember all of these the languages. But he just he wants to make sure that this movie, which is a part of his propaganda 
campaign to seed the way for these aliens is respectful. Hilarious. And that's when it clicks into place that this guy's financing the movie. <laughs> <laughs> this is 21st century Ed Wood kind of shit. I love it. Was, it. I love it. Was it. Am- it was amazing. Well, and was- why aren't we going to feel like idiots in, in two years when they show up? And my yeah, going to be right? like, told you. <laughs> told you. I was I was here. <laughs> I was here. I was spreading the gospel of the aliens, bro. That's amazing. That's fantastic, Ed. So did it get made? <laughs> Honestly, bro, I did my I did what I was contracted to do and then I was like, I do not want to do any more. Well, sure. And they paid me and I left. Okay, good. So I, I I really don't know if it got made or not. Um Have you I gone hope, have you I'm sorry, continue and then I'll ask you my question. I was just gonna say I ho- I hope it got made for Milan. Well you know? yeah. I just I yeah, just absolutely. want him to have his propaganda. Have you, know? have you ever gone to those movie expos where they're all the low budget movies and they're really looking for kind of foreign distributors and stuff? And like they, like you said, they've got the title, they've got the poster, and they're trying to cut these deals. I mean, this is this is obviously literally what happens at Con and bigger yeah. uh, film festivals and things as well. But I know that, like in LA. Um, Because I've talked to some people that have made these, like, kind of no-budget movies that, you know, yeah, they set up and it's like, yeah, I made a movie about cicadas and how, you know, that's their bug infestation movie and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, and and they kind of told me that. So have you gone to those kind of conventions at all? No, I never have. But honestly, if I knew that that was happening, I totally would. (laughs) I wish, I kind of wish it happened in Chicago because I certainly would as well. Well, and again, you know, I'll tell you, I get... Uh, PR, um, press releases, and also uh, the opportunity to get screeners and uh, of tons of low-budget horror films and other genre films, I wish I was more of a horror film fan, because I would absolutely fold that into Word Balloon, because as you know, a lot of these people are, are films and, and even, you know, potential TV productions, you know, they're getting... Actors that are still out there, you know, doing what they can to get work. And sometimes, you know, Dominique Swain from uh, Lolita. I just, I got a Western uh, within the last month. And she was in it. And Barry Corbin, who is a great character actor. He was in War Games. He was on the uh, show Northern Exposure. And, yeah, yeah. And, and more recently on Charlie Sheen's Anger Management. And was a recurring character. Also on um, The Ranch, the uh, Ashton Kutcher Netflix mm-hmm. streaming show, and he was a recurring character there, uh, and also Lance Hendrickson from uh, from Millennium and uh, Aliens vs Predator and the like and stuff. Yeah. So you know these are name actors. This is what they're doing now, you know. And um, I'm I'm intrigued and likely might follow up. And here's a teaser, word balloon fans. So you might actually hear the filmmakers and stuff. In fact, I just had a guy on who made a Demon Hunter movie with William Shatner and Jerry Ryan. But he also made a biopic uh, about Leonard Skinner and the plane crash that took out several key members of the band. And I let him promote, you know, I talked to him for about a half hour and I gave him 10 minutes to talk about the Demon Hunter movie. And I'm like, all right, let's talk about the Skinner movie. Because that's really, that's, that to me is much more interesting. And he's just getting, I mean, people can hear it. It's, it's on the Word Balloon feed. It's only a, a month or two ago. And, um, you know, I was really curious about the movie, and he's just starting to put it into festivals. And he's like, "Yeah, I, I kind of want to, you know, to kind of get more legs before I really start talking about it." And okay, that's cool. I understand. And I'll and I every ninety five percent of them are horror films, and I'm just I'm not a horror guy. I really I, I just I'm I'm just not into it. I respect the genre and certainly the appeal, and I wish I was because I mean, I, like I said, I totally fold a lot of these into word balloon because I think they'd be interesting conversations. But it would be a chore for me to watch these horror movies. I can't I can't lie. But I would watch no. a, I would watch a western. I will watch a sci fi movie on, uh, that are made on these. So I would I likely would have watched Navy Seals versus Aliens. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm, I mean, you you, know. you might still be able to. I have I honestly have no idea if it got made or not. Um, I will say that the only joke that I liked in the whole movie they I know for a fact got cut. Oh. Uh, yeah, I, I I wrote a Zsa Zsa Gabor joke, and they were like, mm-mm, nope, mm-mm. 
I was like, this is great. Is it what? It's a jo- you don't like you don't like my Zsa Zsa Gabor joke? This is amazing. See, she's got the kind of name that even though gener- younger generations would have no idea who Zsa Zsa Gabor is, like, come on, it's a great name, man. You know, it's like that's thanks. exact. John, that was that was my logic too. Yeah, I was like, who who the fuck cares if we actually know who Zsa Zsa Gabor is? That the name is cool sounding. It's funny sounding. Let's just use it as the punchline. There was a baseball but, player, oh, I believe, in the '60s. Van Lingo Mungo was his real name. <laughs> And, that's a fucking, yeah. that's a dope name. Well, there was like this weird novelty song, and all it was was these exotic baseball names. And that was the title of the song, I want to say, Van Lingo Mungo. Or at least it was the first words in the song. And it was this it's like... dope ass name. Yeah, man, and it was like this 60s kind of bossa nova, you know, instrumental and, and beat, and this guy was just kind of scatting, uh, doing, well, scatting then, of course, just means, you know, singing jazz yeah. as opposed to right. defecating, right, yeah. you know, so... Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Boy, the way slang changes. Who the hell knew? Uh, yeah. But yeah, well, did you do another? Did you do like a Corman thing? I did not. We, I was in, I was, I was sniffing around that thing for a minute. But I honestly, there was a, there was a period where I was just kind of taking on any writing work that there was, sure. just because I needed to pay the bills. And ultimately, I ended up working on a documentary uh, for a couple years, oh, wow. and that was the, that was the thing that kind of kept me afloat for a while um and instead of that corman thing that we were talking about at that one convention many many years ago okay okay um, well again and yeah. i mean corman is like the biggest name but the, you know there's full moon there's there's asylum there's uh i'm trying to oh man you know. if anybody if anybody listening to this is a full moon employee i i love trancers there you and go. i will write the shit out of a trancers movie oh man <laughs> tim thomerson right trancers forever Forever and was yes. it was this character Jack Death D E T H D E T H baby Oh yeah Oh yeah That was great You know it's, and isn't that crazy Like Tim Thomerson was totally comedian like buddies with like um, Richard Lewis and Louis Anderson and of that generation and stuff like that and he just kind of falls into that crazy four movie. Wasn't it like trans- was it four Transfers movies? I believe. Oh yeah. Well, there's there's four original ones, and no, there's five five original ones. Wow. Uh, but the last two are pretty bad. Also, both of those last two movies were written by Peter David. Um, Holy shit! I didn't know that. That's amazing. Yeah, I think they filmed them in like Romania or Bulgaria or something. Of course. I think. Of course. I think like Charlie Band like found a castle, and then he was like, "All right, we're making a movie in this castle. What are we gonna make?" And I think. Peter David was just a big transfer fan. He's like, ah, they go to a night time period. I don't know. Why not? Why not? Yeah. That's awesome. No, I do. And then, and then Tim Thomerson is also in, like, I think he's in three of the five Nemesis movies. Have you seen those? those no. Are, those, aren't, those aren't Full Moon. Those are Empire, I believe, okay. which is Charlie Band's other company, uh, directed by uh, old dirty... Uh, uh, Albert Pune, who directed that Captain America movie from the nineties, the Matt Salinger um, Captain America movie, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. I went through a big phase. I went through a big phase uh, where I only watched movies that starred kick kickboxers. Oh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, of course you did. Yeah, I, I, but you, but you couldn't be you couldn't be a kickboxer that transitioned into being an actual actor. You had to be like you were a kickboxer, and you're only in the movie really because you're a kickboxer. Well, sure. For the uh, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. like, Olivier Grunner, who was the world kickboxing champion of, like, 89 or 90, he was in this really shitty movie called Nemesis, which Empire Pictures produced, which is basically what if you took RoboCop and Terminator and Blade Runner and just kind of, like, put them in a blender, but then removed every highbrow pseudo-inclination from them <laughs> and we got left with just, like, a John Woo, like, bullet storm movie. Starring Olivier Grunner, and it is oh, it's it's just Chef Kiss gif, man. It's so good. Well, the, I love it so much. You know, do you know Tim Seeley or Mike Norton at all? Uh, I know Mike a little bit through convention stuff. Okay, because I mean that's literally every day they're watching shitty movies like that, and 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 really like I mean Mike is a connoisseur of the worst eighties movies ever. And, uh, oh, God, what was the one, Robert Ginty, The Exterminator or whatever? Was that? Yeah, oh, hell yeah. You see, man. again, these are like the Citizen Kane's of these terrible D movies, Z movies. I mean, I don't even know. I mean, they're I certainly mean, lower than B, you know. My, uh, my, my, go-to, my go-to guy, well, there's two people, but my go-to, like, direct-to-VHS kickboxing 
guy is Don the Dragon Wilson. Of course. Have you ever seen any of his movies? Oh, oh yeah. Man. He's in... Uh, They're so good. He's in Batman, uh, the Val Kilmer yes. Batman movie. Yes, he is. Because he's the yes. guy that antagonizes Chris O'Donnell when, when Robin takes the Batmobile for the joyride and stuff like that. Fuck yeah. Yeah. He's also in... Uh, Blood Fist 1 through 5. <laughs> of course he is. <laughs> he's, he's also in uh, a, a, one of my favorite movies, Future Kick, which is a, a really shitty martial arts knockoff of the Terminator about a guy who travels back in time and has to stop a robot from killing somebody who's going to save, the, you know, oh, uh, birth the, fu- the savior of mankind. But the robot inexplicably kicks everyone all the fucking time. Do do these movies end up, because as, as a lot of the listeners probably already know, uh, one of the joys of streaming is a lot of these free networks that, you know, they'll insert commercials every 10 minutes or so, like Tubi and Pluto and, yeah. you know, things like that. Is this where they, these movies wind up? I mean, beyond, you know, because... You know, dude, some of it is that, some of it's that, some of it's Prime. Like, there's a lot of really shitty movies Amazon on Prime. Amazon Prime, you're 100% right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also, a lot of it, just on YouTube. There's a well, lot that's of true. movies on YouTube. Yes, there are. Yes, and in fact, uh, I recorded a, a new conversation with uh, Matt Fraction, and I, I a lot of old TV movies, and I mean... Not just 80s and 90s. I mean old TV movies like 70s and stuff. Like uh, Gene Roddenberry's wonderful The Quester Tapes, which... Oh, hell yeah. And I add up, boy. I figured you'd know. You know, and for people who don't know, like, that's where Data came came from, basically, was Roddenberry's ideas for The Quester Tapes. And it's this... And also, also caused a major rift in his friendship with uh, Leonard Nimoy, because he promised the role of Questor to Leonard Nimoy... And then the studio didn't want him, and Leonard Nimoy felt betrayed by him. Never heard that story, but that's amazing. Robert Forrester became Quester, who was yep. uh, Elizabeth Bewitch. Uh, I don't, I don't remember if they actually got married or not, but they were together until Elizabeth Montgomery died, and she had a previous marriage prior to that. But, uh, but yeah, I, I, you know, Robert Forrester. Robert Forrester's in um, Deep Space Nine, the Homefront episode where the the two parter. Where the Dominion is got everybody scared on Earth, and they declare martial law, and he's the evil admiral that's kind of yeah. behind it all, and like, no, this is good, and it'll take power, it'll consolidate power in Starfleet rather than you know the president of the Federation and stuff like that. Great, great two parter, and Robert Forster was a fantastic actor, but I could have seen Nimoy as Quester, and that's a shame. That's interesting. Have you uh, have you ever seen his Roddenberry's other pilot, uh, Spectre? I was going to ask you the same question. Of course, I have a great movie. Now that's got a horror kind of tinge to it, but a modern day kind of Sherlock Holmes. And in fact, we were just talking about Elizabeth Montgomery. Her first husband, Gig Young, is the boozy Watson to Robert Culp's Sherlock Holmes. Yeah. And it's yeah. a, you know, of course, I bet you already know Gig Young was supposed to be the gunslinger in Blazing Saddles. And unfortunately, was an alcoholic and started having DTs on the set. And Mel Brooks even talks about it constantly when he talks about like how Gene Wilder was cast. And literally, like he, you know, the character was supposed to be a drunk anyway, and he's foaming at the mouth. And Mel Brooks is like, "Oh my god, this actor is amazing! Look at this! He can actually like pretend to have DTs, <laughs> but he really was having DTs." And they literally had to like call an ambulance and, and cart him away. And in an emergency situation, because they were already in production, he calls Gene Wilder and he's like, I need you. Please come. You know, and, and filled it because he wanted the gunslinger to be an older actor. And he considered a couple other old character actors and settled on Gig Young. It's tragic because Gig Young was a great actor, a really, and he's in uh, They Shoot Horses, Don't They? The amazing uh, Jane Fonda movie from the early 70s that was a real critical and, and commercial success. And uh, yeah, poor Gig Young man. He he. It ended badly for him, and you can see the damage on his face when he's doing Spectre. I love Spectre. Roddy McDowell in it, amazing. And again, there's a movie that's on YouTube, definitely. Yeah, it, it, the the script is also very easily accessible. Yes, um, it's a good story. Which I mean, it's a really good. Yeah, story. I don't know if I don't know if a lot of people love to do that, but that's that's like my crack cocaine is like to find some weird fucking, you know, made-for-TV movie, and then be like, I wonder if the screenplay is any good. <laughs> oh, that's funny, man. No, I understand. And you know, my buddy Rob Burnett, uh, who directed Free Enterprise, and also quite the uh, YouTube pundit these days, um, he turned me on, I don't have the title handy, but there's a great 
book that really explored the history of network television movies from the 60s to the 90s and would have synopses of, of all these great, and, and even the shitty, you know, great or shitty movies, tons of horror, tons of interesting sci-fi, every genre, every genre was covered in these TV movies. And you can find, I'd say 80% of them still on YouTube, and it's fantastic. And honestly, yeah, I, I love that shit. I mean, you know, of course, Night Stalker, the wonderful uh, Ga- Darren McGavin oh, yeah. show, was a great, you mm-hmm. know, Six Million Dollar Man was a movie of the week before it was a show. Mm-hmm. So yeah, no, there were a lot of a lot of great classic cult television started as you know these TV movies, and you know, yeah, they, the hope was to create a series, and it's a shame. Spectre would have been a very great show for Robert Culp and Gig Young. It's a shame. Yeah, it's like a, it's I mean, it, it it's X Files, like, absolutely X Files, thirty years before X Files, yeah. and. And also, oh, John, that that fucking lizard costume at the end of the fucking episode. Sorry, spoilers for anybody who hasn't seen it, but man, ah, uh, there's this there's this super cool, weird plastic dude in a rubber suit snake monster at the end of the episode that's like doing this crazy, like mystic, uh, you know, kind of like blood rite ritual. And it was, oh, uh, I just it, I when I when I saw that suit it just it was like i i i the the future is dark i wish that we had seven seasons of specter because imagine what it would have how weird it would have gotten you know yeah. after like the ratings slump you know what i mean well, and like would, it, would, it would would roddenberry have ever gone back to star trek if one of these because he had that he had earth 2 or whatever it was called with john saxon yep. and some of these other yep. and, and a lot of those ideas ended up in earth final conflict and Armageddon, and I, you know, some, I, or actually, maybe not Earth Final Conf- Conflict. Maybe that wasn't the Roddenberry. Maybe that wasn't a Roddenberry idea. I can't remember. But a lot of I don't remember. Yeah, I don't remember the title. But there's the, there's those two. He ba- he made the same show fucking twice and had John Saxon starring it. Oh yeah. Time. Oh yeah. But I was thinking like uh, Kevin Sorbo's show Andromeda. That's what I was thinking. Oh Andromeda, Andromeda. And a lot yeah, of yeah, ideas yeah. in Andromeda came from a lot of these '70s Roddenberry ideas as well. Um, yeah. And then, yeah, no, it's, yeah, it's what if. It really is what if in a lot of ways. And the one I was telling uh, people here when I talked to Fraction, but I'll share with you as well, it may or may not be known, but Sammy Davis Jr. was a demon worshiper for a while in the 70s. And that's not a bullshit thing. That's a real thing. And he made this weird TV movie called Poor Devil. And he's a demon, and Christopher Lee plays Satan, and it's a comedy and he is trying to uh, corrupt Jack Klugman into selling his soul. And it's a very weird movie. I believe it's pre-Odd Couple. Klugman does not have his toupee. It's definitely pre-Quincy. Klugman doesn't have his toupee on, but it's hilarious. <laughs> and it's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. And it is a comedy. And, yeah, and it's pre, because uh, I told Fraction about it, and he remembered uh, the Disney film, The Devil and Max Devlin, with Elliot Gould and Bill Cosby as as the demon, uh, and uh, I'm, he's like, "Oh, it was inspired by that." I'm like, "Oh no, no, no! This was like five or six years before that." And so, yeah, man, if you're uh, if if you're fascinated by Sammy Davis, uh, he was into demonology for a cup of coffee and everything, and this movie absolutely was part of it. And it's it, it's it's a comedy. I mean, it's not scary at all. It's a very funny movie. It's an attempt, I should say. It's funny in spite of itself. It's that kind of right. funny. But yeah, good stuff, man. You're killing me. Good stuff. <laughs> there you go, Dave. Good job, man. No, this was all great. So uh so yeah, you know, uh, promote promote uh what else you want uh, whatever, whatever else you want to promote as we as we wrap up, man. Yeah. Uh I guess if anybody so for, I'm I mean, I guess I'm not that surprised just cuz we, you know, I feel like we always talk about weird dumb movies and shit when when we run into oh, each but other. This is great. Yeah. But it's it's funny to me that <laughs> Spent so long talking about Robert Cole. That's fine. Uh, <laughs> not Judy. You know, you listen to Word Balloon. This is I exa- do. I this do. This is exactly yeah, what. Absolutely. But you know, that's one hundred percent. But Dave, this is the great thing because honestly, like I just talked to Rucka, and we spent ten minutes talking about, or maybe longer, about getting keyboards that mimic manual typewriters that you can USB into your laptop or PC or whatever, and they're great. And I bought one, and it's fantastic. And you know that someone is going to go to Rucka at a convention and go, you know, I bought, I heard you talking about that. Because that's the great thing 
that I love beyond. I mean, hey, I'm I'm here to help everybody promote their stuff. Absolutely, but it's this kind of weird corridor shit that I think sticks with people. And I guarantee you, there's going to be other people that have seen Spectre that will likely come up to you at a con and go, "Yeah, I heard you talking about that on Word Balloon." I certainly hope so. Yeah, I hope so. I also hope that they uh, they that I don't get sued by anyone because I may or may not have drawn that lizard costume uh, <laughs> into a few comics over the Outstanding. years. Outstanding! <laughs> That's fantastic, man. That's great. Yeah. Too damn funny. Uh, but yeah, if uh, you know, wrapping up, yeah. if anybody is interested in my uh, in my comics, like Fuck Off Squad or Action Hospital or Shitty Watchmen. Uh, do you, want, you can find him at uh, heydavebaker.com. Do you want to talk about Action Hospital for a second and then let people yeah, get sure. fuck off squad? I mean, we could certainly do that while we're while we're uh, still talking here. I, I, I yeah, want to yeah. just let you promote your books. So, yeah, please, man. <laughs> yeah, so uh, Action Hospital is kind of like um, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind meets Men in Black set in a hospital uh, with the added twist that all the characters in the hospital are paired with individual artists. So whenever they show up, they're always drawn by the same person. So sometimes there's like eight artists working on one page. Um, there's three volumes of it. Uh, I write all three. Um, the first one is drawn in that kind of collaborative style. Uh, the second one I I draw 99% of. And then the third one I pencil and Erwin Papa inks. Wow. Um, yeah, each one of them is uh, like about 300 pages long. Wow. Uh, yeah, they, they took, I think volume one took six years to finish. Uh, it's like my Fitzcarraldo, man. Like I, by the end of that thing, I, by the end of that thing, I was just like, let it be done. Oh, you're killing me. Let good it be good done. movie pull right there. That's very good, man. Hilarious. Yeah. Uh, but I'm very, I'm very happy that the, the books are finished and they're in print and it's, it's very, uh, it's very rewarding, you know. As a cartoonist, you spend a lot of time by yourself. You spend a lot sure. of time in your own head, yeah. and it's very rewarding to be able to be at a convention and and just hand somebody three hundred pages of this is this is who I am for six years. Uh, you can, you know, for better or for worse, see see my my flaws and foibles and and <laughs> the bright spots. Excellent. Fuck off, squad. You want to mention that? Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, fuck off, squad. I co-create with uh, Nicole Gu, who's drawing DC Comics' Shadow of the Batgirl, which comes out in February. Hey, that's awesome. Um, Good for her. Yeah. Um, so we co-created a book, Fuck Off Squad. It's a coming-of-age romance comic about skater kids in Los Angeles. It's kind of about navigating the gap between being a teenager and being an adult and being really shitty at both. Um, it's kind of a uh, you know, slice-of-life drama. About uh, kick flips and and uh, being being real sad, being real sad. <laughs> That's outstanding, man. Very cool. Great stuff, Dave. Excellent, man. And, and really, I, like I said, your uh, your total nerd channel on YouTube. Uh, I'm like, wait a minute, that's Dave Baker. I know who that is. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, let me check in with Dave. Jesus, what's he doing these days? So no, it was great, man. A great excuse to uh, catch up and uh, let you promote. And uh, wonderful conversation about uh, Z grade movies out there that. Everyone should be aware of, and uh, here's hoping that uh, uh, you know, in, in your screenwriting pursuits, that uh, you know, we get to see a filmography from Dave Baker uh, beyond the online stuff he does, and certainly his comics as well. But uh, hey, man, congratulate! Listen, I know you're on the journey, and I know you know every like your Kickstarter success. All that's a great moment, man. So enjoy that, enjoy the ride, and enjoy the the journey to. You know what's happening, but you're a good, talented, creative guy, and uh, you know, as far as I'm concerned, we're we're all on the same path, and we'll get we'll get to the promised land. Don't worry about it. Just keep doing it. <laughs> Thanks, John. Yeah. Thank you. There you go, man. That was good. I enjoyed that. That was fun. Yeah, that was fun. I didn't know that you. Would- fun conversation with Dave Baker. Make sure you uh, support his stuff and uh, check out Total Nerd, the uh, YouTube channel where uh, Dave is cranking out some really great. Uh, comic book history uh, lessons that I think we can all appreciate. Uh, really happy to have uh, welcomed Dave back to Word Balloon today. I hope you enjoyed this episode. It was uh, brought to you by the League of Word Balloon listeners. Thank you, League, for your support uh, via Patreon. Again, if you'd like to subscribe to Word Balloon, as I always say, Word Balloon is free, but if you want to help out the cause, go to patreon.com slash wordballoon or click on the ad at wordballoon.com, right on the front page, the Patreon ad. Thank you greatly for your support, League of Word Balloon listeners. 
We're Balloon also brought to you by Aftershock Comics. Uh, they've got great books uh, for you this month already out there and coming uh, as well uh, in the next couple of weeks of November. I'm talking about things like the dark red collected trade of the first five issues, volume one, from uh, Tim Seeley and Corin Howell. Uh, there's also Dark Ark issue two, After the Flood, from Cullen Bunn and Juan Doe. Uh, Animosity, uh, year two, the hardcover collection is out now and available for you from Marguerite Bennett and Raphael De La Tour. You can also get the latest ed- issue of uh, Animosity, issue number 25. There's uh, volume three of Baby Teeth, Donny Cates' uh, unbelievable series with uh, Gary Brown. Really great stuff there. And also issue 17 of Baby Teeth, out this month from Aftershock. Uh, issue 5 of Knight's Temporal, from Cullen Bunn, coming very soon. Also the complete series of Rough Riders, from Adam Glass and Pat Olaf. Really fun. Matthew Klickstein's uh, third issue of You Are Obsolete is coming your way shortly. Issue 4 of Bad Reception, from Juan Doe, on the way. Shoppers Will Be Liquidated from Patrick Kinden and Stefano Simone, and uh, Midnight Vista from Elliot Real and Clara Meath. Interesting stuff, great books, waiting for you from Aftershock Comics. Go to their website, look for full story descriptions, preview pages, and the diamond codes on how to order these books through your local shop at aftershockcomics.com. Thanks a lot for listening. Great stuff coming and continuing throughout the month of November. Really excited about... Um, not only the comic book guests, but dare I tease some other celebrity guests that are coming as well uh, from the world of television in the next couple weeks here at Word Balloon. I hope you will stick around and check them out. Until next time, Word Balloon is a copyright feature of Shaky Productions, copyright 2019.